and also those of you who are joining us online via Teams. Thank you for being here. Um, this is our roundtable discussion, William Morris, Helmstadt Press, and the book Beautiful. Um, I'm Dr. Miriam Mitchator. I am the Rare Book Librarian at Ohio University Libraries, um, and today I will be moderating. I'm going to go over a few logistical details before I introduce each of our speakers, and then we'll get the conversation started. So once we begin, we're going to hear a short presentation from each faculty member. Um, and then after each has spoken, we'll open up the floor to questions and discussion. So please hold any questions until the end. For those of you who are joining online, um, your cameras and your sound are muted. Um, so anytime you have a question, please enter it into the chat. Our wonderful events coordinator, Jen Harvey, will be moderating the chat. And she will read questions out loud so that everyone can hear them. Um, if you have trouble hearing at any point, can be difficult with the math. If you're online, please let us know in the chat. If you're in the room, please, you know, wait on us. Um, so with all that out of the way, um, I'd like to provide some introductory context as to how this roundtable came to be. William Morris, you may all know, was a famous 19th century English designer, social reformer, author, book collector, and bookmaker. He's so well known, or at least continues to be recognized, for his still popular textile design, especially. Last summer, the William Morris Society in the United States put out a call for exhibits, presentations, and other content um, to be created to honor the June 26, 2021, 130th anniversary of the founding of William Morris's Kelmscott Press and 125 years since the publication of his magnum opus, the Kelmscott edition of the works of Geoffrey Chaucer, considered by some to be the most beautiful book ever printed. Inspired by the call as an opportunity to showcase relevant items in our rare book collection, I created a digital exhibit, which some of you may have already seen. And then when we were back in person this fall, I created a physical exhibit as well. That is on the fifth floor of Alden Library, and I hope that some of you will go upstairs when we finish today um, to see it or come back later in the semester to explore. To be more specific about my source of inspiration, the signature item manuscript Latin Bible, which, as it happened, previously belonged to none other than William Moore. Even more important than it naturally is as an 800-year-old example of medieval European hand craftsmanship and religious tradition and practice. It also serves as the centerpiece for our celebration of William manuscripts, books, and bookmaking that inspired and informed the beautiful works produced by which we also have on display upstairs. The faculty who are invited to speak today are with our time about press books. So now we'll hear I'm going to read them all now in which they will So starting things off for us will be Miriam Shadis, Associate Professor of History and Medievalist. She is the author of, and excuse my pronunciation, um, of Castile, 1180 to 1246, the Political Women of the High Middle East. Her current research examines Portuguese queenship in the 12th and 13th century. Arts. He is a cultural historian who specializes in early, early medieval manuscript illumination. Interests include art and power, word and image, iconology, and art and performance. Widely published internationally, Dr. Buchanan is just finishing a book entitled Visual Polemics in Central Italian Manuscripts of the 11th Century Church Reform. Neil Bernstein is a professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies where he's taught since 2004. 
He has been a distinguished scholar in residence at Western University in Ontario, a National Humanities Center fellow at Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and a Fulbright lecturer at National Taiwan University in Taipei. Also author of multiple books, his most recent is Silius Italicus's Punica, Rome's War with Hannibal. And his current project is a translation of Claudian's complete work for Rutledge. Joe McLaughlin is Associate Professor of English, specializing in Victorian literature. His research and teaching interests include serialized fiction, the history of the book, and Britain's global entanglements. Among other publications, he is the author of Writing the Urban Jungle, Reading Empire in London from Doyle to Elliot. And finally, to round things off, Nicole Reynolds is an Associate Professor of English and of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Author of Building Romanticism, Literature and Architecture in 19th Century Britain, she teaches and researches in British literature and culture of the long 19th century, as well as in book history. So that's all of our speakers. Miriam Chavis will start us off. I will invite the rest of you to sit so that you can see the slide. I will dim the light and get started. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly here about my experience of working with the uh, Bible, the Real Latina, and my students. And I'm going to show you just a couple of things that I tend to show them when I bring them to the library to see the manuscripts. Um, the courses that I have been able to bring to the class, to the library so far, include a kind of a general survey of medieval history. Um, Sometimes I've been able to bring my uh, medieval women's history class to the library. And my goal is always to have them just have some tactile experience of the medieval period, right? This is a really special opportunity for them and for me to kind of, you know, hold the medieval in your hands. I tell them, you're going to hold this Bible. And a lot of them won't touch it because, because they're afraid, because it's so valuable and precious. But, but they really have a great experience with it. So um, I'm going to sort of hit four big points here. One is to talk about the students for a moment. Um, what I tell them, what I focus on with them, is the construction of the book. Um, we look at the parchment, the ink. They've been learning about oak gall ink, for example. We, we talk about gesso and the application of the, of the gold leaf in the Bible. Um, we look at the, um, the content a little bit. You know, my Latin's not great, and theirs is pretty much non-existent. But they, they think they know the Bible, and so we look at how it's organized and, and, and put together in that way as a text. And then the extras. Um, these are probably things that don't really fit into the, the William Morris aspect of our conversation, but that are um, kind of make this particular volume stand out, things that are special about it that I can show them. So the first thing, whoops, that's me. Okay. The first thing I'm gonna, uh, that I show them when we talk about is the prologue which the first time I saw this in, was in this book, and I was completely flabbergasted. I did not appreciate that many medieval Bibles included Jerome's prologue. Okay? You may or may not know that, that uh, St. Jerome in the fourth century put together and edited the Vulgate Bible, the, the Bible in Latin that we are used to working with today, um, at least if we're medievalists. And so, um, Jerome's prologue, he writes an explanation of this task and he explains, you know, to write to the Pope, Pope Demasius, and says, and it's long, in fact, I'm giving you a little quote here, um, you know, explains what he's about and how much pressure he's under uh, to do this. He says, you urge me to revise the old Latin version and, as it were, to sit in judgment on the copies of the scriptures, which are now scattered throughout the whole world, by which he means, I think, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean. But the whole world. And in as much as they differ from one another, you would have me decide which of them agree with the Greek original. The labor is one of love, but at the same time, we're perilous and presumptuous, for in judging others, I must be content to be judged by all. And how can I dare to change the language of the world in this hoary old age and carry it back to the early days of its infancy? And at this point, my students have probably lost. They're like, you're crazy. Because this is so exciting to me that I 
I think it's really interesting. We start, we start out and I say, what do you know about the Bible? And they tell me, and, and what's the first book of the Bible? And they all know Genesis. In the beginning, I'm like, aha, this Bible has this element to it. And we can really think about how, you know, historically, this thing was put together by a person. Um, and then multiple people over time, right, created this particular uh, edition of this Bible. So here's the prologue. And you can see up here it says, um, it's, it's abbreviated, as it would be, uh, prologus. Right? That's the, just so we know. So this is the first page of our Bible. Um, the second piece that I talk to them about, or that I like to talk about, and um, are the manicules. All right? The manicules are those little pointy fingers that show you where a text is important. And um, this book, I don't, I was trying to find out how many there are in it, but there are a lot. And there are some pages where there are as many as four or five. A very enthusiastic commenter has told us what he thinks is important here. I use the word he advisedly. Um, almost certainly, these were these were men working with this book and, and writing in it. I think that the the discussion of the manifolds is not. I don't think they're well studied. Here's one here. Here's one here. I'll show you a close up in a minute. Um, there's one down here. One over here. Um, these things possibly likely were added after the book was constructed. But they could be um, part of the actual construction of the book. I think that it's hard to tell because the ink, as far as I can tell, is the same. Right? But oak ball ink, which is the kind of ink that they would have used, would have been used uh, repeatedly. Okay? So other people may know more about that than I do. Um, the students love this. right? It's underlined in the book. And it's a way to sort of appreciate um, what the reader appreciates. So here's a. Just one example, this is from this page we just looked at. Here's the close-up of the manicule. I went to look at the, the text um, from the Vulgate, and this is this happens to be, this is a random choice. But this this uh, commenter wanted us to know that we should not swear, uh, this is bad, and, and we shouldn't be doing it. So extra extra emphasis on this passage of Ecclesiastes. Okay? Um, do not accustom your mouth to oaths. Do not habitually utter the name of the whole one. The translation that I have here is not precisely coordinated with the Vulgate original. I think it's not it's somebody else's translation. Okay. Finally, uh, Queen Esther, and I know that Charles is going to talk about Esther in a minute. Um, this is a this is a really wonderful piece for me to show them, and uh, it, and for the students, you know, they're they, they're cloud flabbergasted by this book. It's amazing. It's beautiful. It's full of gold. It has so much the weight, literally, of history associated with it. Um, and the images are funky and, and few, really, compared to many illuminated Bibles or other manuscripts. Um, they're mostly little animals like this one here, this little dragon creature here. Um, and very few humans, and only one woman. And the woman is Queen Esther. And here you can see up here it says Hester. This is the book of Esther. Um, what's interesting about this image um, out of the context of this book is that Esther is rarely um, imagined in medieval illumination. She doesn't show up as a, as a typical choice. So that makes this book a little bit different. Also, Esther is carrying a sword. Um, and I, I should, like, Taking notes on the Book of Esther, but but Esther is a you know she's a great Jewish heroine. She saves her people, um, but she's not sword wielding. That is Judah, and so I think there some people think there could be some confusion here um, whether the the illuminator just kind of thought you know powerful woman got to put a sword in her hand. Is she a queen? She's a queen. She's got a sword. I'm interested in that idea because I study queens. I think that um, we underestimate the degree of their military and and uh, secular power. Um, so here's an image that is confusing to us for a lot of reasons and also really, really interesting. Um, and just for comparison, I'm going to now leave the Bible and show you these images because these are the kinds of images I think that we mostly um, expose our students to when we're looking at illuminated Bibles or, or, or manuscripts in general. Um, these are both from a particular genre of Bible, which was the, uh, the moralized Bible. It sort of told stories in full page illuminations. And this is one I work with a lot. This is the, the Bible of Saint Louis, and I use it because it shows his mother Blanche, who was one of my subjects of study, and it's super beautiful. And it has some elements of our, our Bible, it has the gold leaf, for example. Um, and then this one here 
of the resurrection um, has the sleepy soldiers down on the bottom and Christ emerging from the tomb. So these are just these are other kinds of experiences that students might have that our Bible won't offer them. But my feeling is always very much that this particular manuscript is more maybe normal, more usual, less, it's deluxe, but it's not as deluxe as some other kinds of things. And so it gives us a, a place to start thinking about how medieval people encountered um, the written word, how they constructed it, what they thought about it, um, and how they carried it around, because that's the other thing about our Bible. It is totally portable. So I'm going to stop there, and thank you very much. And I think Charles, are you next? Yep. So we're very curious to see how you <laughs>
Bibles like this were created for mass distribution at French cathedral universities in the 13th century. My belief is that this manuscript is a French manuscript, a northern French manuscript. Um, and as I referred to earlier, there was this kind of assembly line production in the Gothic period in the 13th century for manuscripts like this. Um, so the, the text is written initially, and then what happens is the book is passed on to the so-called rubricator, who inserted red and blue, uh, what are referred to as pen flourish initials. And this is what the, these things are um, here, as well as little rubrications here. This is a chapter heading um, in the book of Ecclesiasticus. Um, and one thing that's interesting about the production of the book is that on occasion where, where it has not been trimmed too much, you'll see little marginal notations like the letter phi here as, a, as a, a guide to the rubricator to include the number five, the chapter five of Ecclesiasticus right there. Um, I'm an art historian by training, so I'm particularly interested in the style and the content of the images. And uh, one thing that I think is characteristic of these pen flourish initials is what I call this tinsel-like linearity. And it parallels the, the, the delicate stonework known as bar tracery that abounds in contemporaneous, contemporaneous Gothic architecture like Amiens Cathedral. Um, painted medieval manuscripts in general are referred to as illuminated from the French word illuminé or to light up. And the last part of the process of folio preparation was the insertion of these introductory painted initials that included gold leaf, the inspiration for the term illuminé. And after the text and illuminations were inserted, the gatherings were stacked, sewn together, and finally bound. Morris would have been inspired by the organic vegetation that abounds in OU's Bible, which in its 13th century context, context uh, connotes paradise. And back to the, the one representation of uh, a figure in the manuscript whose name we know, which is Queen Esther, uh, that Dr. Shad has referred to. Um, here I'm placing it within, again, the cultural context. Representations of Old Testament monarchs are often found in French Gothic manuscripts, like the one that Dr. Shad has showed us, uh, the, the Morlas Bible. Esther with sword and trampling a dragon was considered a prefiguration of not only the Queen of France, but also the Virgin Mary, or Notre Dame, whose cult inspired the many decorations of, or the decorations of so many French cathedrals. text of the Bible, the Word of God, has an abundance of substitution, what, what I call substitution initials, that are formed by dragons and hybrid monsters, which were intended for moral con contemplation. So here on the left, um, let me see if I can zoom in here a little bit. Yeah, you'll see there, this is a hybrid uh, monster with a human face, the, the, the uh, hindquarters of an animal. And interestingly, at the groin of this monster, uh, a dragon, you always can identify the dragon by these wings, bites the groin here, and then there's another dragon, I'll cut the image off, that bites the, the kind of uh, belly of this figure here. And then on this side, uh, is a Q substitution initial for the word quote here. Um, and what's represented here is another one of these hybrid monsters, a winged figure um, it, I, with, a, with a claw of, of a, or the talon of a bird. Um, one can often associate this with um, sirens from um, classical antiquity which were moralized in the Middle Ages. Uh, and down here is another one of these dragons. And so in here, what I think of these uh, this mar so-called marginal imagery in the manuscript 
parallels um, contemporaneous marginal Im imagery that's found in Gothic cathedrals, uh, like uh, here's a gargoyle um, from Chartres Cathedral, um, from the exterior of Chartres Cathedral way above your head. So they operate <coughs> in a similar fashion. And that's it. and at the presentation of information on the page. And there is certainly the ooh and ah effect of being able to touch the thing, make sure to do your nails first. Um, this helps them see that Latin is not just something that occurs in their textbook or on you know, marble inscriptions that I have them find around town. But is used in different formats by different people for different reasons. So before they look at this, thanks to Miriam and a, col a collaborator of mine in Canada, Dr. Kyle Trevay, we put together a series of tutorials. There was this pandemic and we couldn't do a lot of this in the manuscript. Room. <laughs> so they looked at OU's digitized collection and got a sort of introduction before this moment of actually coming in contact with the book. So they were sensitized a little to the Gothic, which, yeah, isn't the easiest to read. The upside is this is a beautifully regular Gothic. If you have to suffer through Gothic, at least it's a Gothic that when the scribe has taken it easy on you. So we're going to start not quite at the beginning of the Bible, that's Jerome's preface, but with the first words of the actual text of Genesis. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Okay, but the text that they're going to learn in their textbook is going to put an A in that word title. And for a moment, they'll be thrown off. They'll say, Can I, did I actually read what I thought I read? Okay. Charles, how did you blow it up? How did, uh, how did you manage to blow up? Uh, it's like a PowerPoint. So on the bottom there, okay, so there it is. Oh, yay. Okay, this is, this is even better. Okay. So, they don't trust their eyes at first. Did I really go from the word letter C to the letter E without an A intervening? Now, this is not uh, an orthographical error of the kind that Charles was talking about. There are plenty of those on this page. This is standard medieval spelling, but they're not used to it. And so that shock of, oh yeah, People, you know, over the course of 2,000 plus years, people spelled their Latin differently is one of those moments. Okay, next, I said this is a beautifully regular script, and it is, but, <coughs> but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily aimed at the kind of reader friendliness we're used to. So, for example, you have an upstroke, an upstroke, an upstroke, an upstroke, an upstroke. And you got to take my word for it, right? That you see a letter U and a letter M here. Because at first, you just see a confusion of what are called minimums, the minimal stroke. If you don't know what you're looking for, if you don't know to be sensitive to the lack of a connector here and a connector there, even to an experienced reader, it just looks like a bunch of letter I's, right? And so you can talk about minimum confusion, but not until you're actually nose to page with manuscript will it actually come home to you what that means. Next, not so much on the Morris Bible, but on some other elements of the Farkle collection that are fun to look at. I love to talk about information presentation. I tell them about the revolution in information consumption that I went through when I started being surgically attached to this thing. And so I asked them, well, what's weird about the way information is presented on this page? And trust me, there are pages that we look at that are far weirder than this, but it's weird enough for the minute to say, okay, here's my text. There's a really large capital I, all by a, a somewhat large letter on them. And I've got my, my first words. In the beginning, God created heaven. What's all this? Interfering with where my eye wants to go, right? That's not something we would normally do, even on the wackiest website, right? Okay, furthermore, 
Um, how do I undo this now? Okay. Furthermore, this heading <laughs> does what initially looks like something a middle schooler might do. You, I've got a middle schooler at home, so you know I know what it's like when you run out of room on the line. Hey, hey what a problem! This <laughs> And again, I have to reassure them, this is not a mistake, okay? This is not, oops, I goofed, right? This is, I use the margin for different purposes than you do, right? Like putting pointing hands, like pulling manicules in, for example. Okay, another thing that makes Gothic difficult is that this text has a wide variety of abbreviations such that, you know, you look at it, you look at it, you know, not that I'm noticing anything, is that a musical score, right? Are we putting notes in? No, okay, but no, but it's forgivable when you see a forest of such super lineal um, markers, you say, can these be letters, right? Again, it's such, what I'm hoping to elicit by teaching with this page is the shock of this was some, something people put, a number of people put a great deal of effort into to produce something that's completely different from what I would associate with information presentation. So, is it a goof that the letter I of Principio is above the line? Maybe, maybe not. But it is not because it happens pretty often that this little diamond point marks the E and the R of Tauron of Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's done it right again here, Tauron Terra. I can't decide whether this I is a goof, but I know this, this dot is not. Similarly, because of the forest of weird abbreviations that we've got here, it's sometimes useful to know where the sentence ends, and our scribe has helped us out by flagging those in red, right? Mm -hmm. And I ask the students, do I sometimes catch you when we're face to face, taking out your highlighter and highlighting the beginnings of sentences? Is this something we do? I don't write in my books, but, but it seems that they do, and they do it more promiscuously now that most of their books are electronic, and it's no, no, not as ruinous to mark the beginnings and ends of sentences. So, as always, I'm asking why is information presented in this way? What does it do about our understanding of how, class, how the difference when we move out of classical Latin grammar book into a medieval book? So, not, I mean, these are the sort of things I would want them to get from this image. That, yeah, it's okay to turn the corner, marking new sentences just as we do with our highlighters. It's beautiful and regular, but that doesn't mean you're spared from minimum confusion if minimum is your basic element. Um, so, we're accustomed to see, again, middle schoolers are told finger space between, between words, right? But and we're, we still use ligatures, for example. In most of your printed books, there'll be a ligature between letters F and I, for example, in the word first, for example. But they're far more common in a manuscript like this. Again, the scribe doesn't want to have to raise his, his risk more than he has to. Okay. Um, um, from there, we go on to individual items that Dr. Carpole left to our library's collection. Leaves from a wide variety of Gothic and humanist manuscripts. Nothing is as difficult for them as the Morris Bible. We don't read anything more difficult than that. And there's a sigh of relief when <laughs> they reach handwriting that looks like theirs by the humanists. And I'm deeply grateful to Miriam and the Farfels for making this possibility for students now again in person. Thank you very much. ahead many centuries now. Um, <laughs> I'd actually like to begin with an orienting quotation that is, that is not about William Morris, but I think is absolutely about William Morris. And, and this was a, 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 the first sentence of a lecture I once heard by the Marxist literary critic Terry Eagleton, which was actually about Marx. Um, and that sentence was simply this, Marx hated capitalism in the first instance because it was ugly. Um, and I think if you keep that in mind, you're going to really learn most of what you need to know about William Morris. Um, so with Morris, whose dates are 1834 to 1896, his life almost 
perfectly overlaps the period of Victoria's reign between uh, 1837 and 1902. Um, two things that really come together over the course of his life and remain a constant uh, and, and, and certainly feed into his enterprise with the Count Scott Press in the last decade of his life are the uh, obsession of the Victorians with medievalism um, but also Morris's commitments, uh, especially in the last decades of his life, to socialism. Um, and those things very much overlap uh, because of the influence of his guru, John Ruskin, who's somebody I'm going to talk about uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Um, but very briefly, Morris came from a wealthy middle class background. Uh, his father made a fortune in finance. Uh, he went to, as a young man, to Oxford University. Uh, and uh, uh, fell in and became really lifelong friends with a couple of the major pre-Raphaelite figures, uh, Edward Byrne Jones and uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Um, and just to give you a little sense of that pre-Raphaelite that Morris aesthetic, um, here is a, a stained glass window he designed uh, in 1862 when he started his design firm, uh, the Arthurian uh, Tales were very important for, for Morris uh, throughout his career. Um, Morris, Morris is uh, perhaps best known to the Victorians uh, as a poet. Um, he wrote lots of long epic length poems on uh, mythological subjects, Arthurian subjects. Uh, he did quote unquote translations of Icelandic sagas. Um, and he was well enough known as a poet that late in his life in, in 1892, when Tennyson died, he was actually uh, one of the people being considered to become the poet laureate. Uh, but at that point, he had a very well-known uh, association with radical politics, and that probably sunk his case. Um, during the 60s and the 70s, Morris was uh, very involved uh, with a design firm, Morris Marshall Faulkner and Company. Um, they uh, certainly did a lot with wallpaper, and, and the, this look should be fairly familiar to you, but they also did much with uh, embroidery, uh, furniture, um, those, those kinds of things. Um, I want to go back to the, uh, I mentioned Ruskin before, and especially the, the sort of seminal influence of uh, a brief essay by Ruskin called The Nature of the Gothic, uh, which is extracted from a longer work of Ruskin's called The Stones of Venice. Uh, and there's a lot in this that's important to Ruskin, but I really want to isolate two things that become uh, important for Morris. One is that the, the sort of overarching idea of that essay uh, is to make a distinction between a set of aesthetic values that are associated with Northern Europe and the Gothic uh, 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 values of the Middle Ages in distinction to an aesthetic associated with Southern Europe and a sort of classicist, uh, classical kind of uh, aesthetic, uh, which fundamentally is important because Ruskin and then Morris will associate that with the values of, of slaveholding societies. Um, and there's a real connection here to abolition work that's going on uh, in, the, in, in the 19th century. Um, but whether they were right or wrong about the Middle Ages, they saw the Middle Ages as a time in which workers had a relative degree of uh, autonomy um, and, and, and freedom uh, as opposed to those people who had built the pyramids and the classical uh, 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 structures in, in, in Greece and Rome. So the Middle Ages for them, oh, and, and fundamentally important, those classical values associated with those slaveholding societies were things that they saw creeping back in uh, with the rise of industrialism and industrial modernity and, and, and factory labor. So the fascination with the Middle Ages was in a very real sense, uh, an active critique of industrial modernity. Um, the second thing I wanna highlight that he gets from, from Ruskin, uh, associated with what I was just talking about, is, is Ruskin's uh, really strong critique of the division of labor that starts to happen in industrial processes, and especially the division between manual labor and mental labor. Um, and, and, and again, there was this idealization of the Middle Ages as a time when the worker uh, was both doing things with their hands and doing things with their mind that was dropping out of modern industrial processes 
as you had people working on assembly lines in factories or people working on uh, design issues, but no longer working with their hands. Um, and, and Ruskin and following him, Morris, saw this uh, as, as a fundamental problem, certainly for workers uh, who were working with their bodies, but not their minds, but also people involved in design and the arts and things like that, who were increasingly brain workers, um, but not working with their, with their bodies. Um, in the 1880s, uh, Morris gets very involved uh, in, in, in socialism. Uh, he publishes a, a couple of essays based upon lectures. One, this one here, uh, Useful Work versus Useless Toil, um, where he talks a lot about alienated labor, about the ways in which in modern conditions uh, work has has been reduced to a kind of mindless drudgery for most people in the world and, and really wants to advocate to a sort of more integrated existence in which people are using their minds and their bodies all at the same time um, and taking pleasure in the in the work process itself through this sort of integration of their physical and mental capacities. Um, another important essay of his is the lesser arts. Uh, again, another key word for Morris following Ruskin is integration. Um, he, he is somewhat dismissive of the fine arts, uh, but really wants to think about the decorative arts and, and, the, and the arts of everyday life. So a really important thing for, for Morris is the idea that the objects that we encounter in our everyday life should not be just useful, but should be beautiful as well. And he sees a kind of degradation that's taking place under industrial production ruled by a kind of utilitarian values in which people are sort of surrounded by um, ugliness um, in the sort of utilitarian pursuit of the cheap. Um, okay, this all comes together uh, in the last decade of Morris's life with the founding of the Count Scott Press uh, uh, in, in collaboration with a friend of his, uh, Emery Walker, who I think Nicole is going to talk about maybe a little bit, a little bit. Um, <laughs> Morris had the capital, Morris had the enthusiasm, Walker knew a lot about books. Um, but really from the 1880s, mid 1880s onward, Morris starts building a library <laughs> and a, a collection of medieval manuscripts and early printed books. Um, that uh, uh, one of which, of course, is the Bible that people have been talking about today. So he, so he owned this. So I'm not talking a lot about teaching in this presentation, but it's really fascinating for students to to look at the Bible that we've seen in the slides, um, and then look at sort of you know the wonderful collection that we have of uh, uh, cheap books, <laughs> early paperbacks, things sold in railway stations. Uh, you can call yellowback novels from the 19th century to look at those next to the Bible um, and then to look at the Count Scott books. Um, and if we had been coordinating better, when I'd been seeing the slides earlier of the Bible, I probably should have put together some slides to let you look at a page um, of, of a Count Scott book. Um, but even better, you can go upstairs after the presentation because they're in the cases up there. Um, so very quickly, and then, and then I'll close. Um, in addition to sort of immersing himself in this kind of visual environment, the kinds of things that Morris was trying to do at the at the Count Scott Press was to sort of reintegrate the process in a in a in a small workshop once again. So in bookmaking, different parts of the book are getting fragmented into different factories and whatnot in the 19th century. He wanted it all in the workshop. Um, he wanted to use handmade paper. Um, he tried to make his own ink. That didn't go very well, but then he <laughs> got a, a shop involved in that. Um, he wanted to use a hand press. Uh, he used vellum bindings. He designed his own fonts, um, especially like some of the, the Gothic fonts that, that Charles was showing us. He became absolutely obsessed with the spacing of letters and the use of generous uh, margins on the page. Um, and using uh, red letters and things like that. Um, 
And so I really encourage you when you go up to look at the Kelmscott books, which you will do, um, <laughs> to, to, to just think about the look at the page in relationship to some of the things that we, we've seen. Um, a lot of the Kelmscott books, and especially the Chaucer, he worked very closely um, with Byrne Jones on this. Uh, the Kelmscott Press, in the course of the 90s, published 53 <coughs> books. Most of those books they published uh, before Morris died in 1896. Um, as, as Miriam Intratour said, the Chaucer was the magnum opus, but it was by no means the only book they did at Kelmscott that had a sort of medieval or medievalist um, kind of content. Um, this book um, has 87 engravings in it by Byrne Jones. A lot of the borders, a lot of the initials that you see in here uh, were done by Morris, and they really worked on this project together um, over the course of uh, six or seven years. Uh, we do not have a Kelmscott Chaucer, we have a facsimile. Um, but Miriam recently sent us a link of one that's for sale right now. So if we have a donor out there with 295,000 pounds, uh, get the Kelmscott Chaucer. Uh, these were done in, in very small batches of around 300, 300 each. Um, so I guess I just want to conclude with thinking about the ways in which these books that, uh, that Morris was producing, uh, although they, they, they sort of harken back to the aesthetic uh, of, of medievalism and the Bible that we were kind of looking at, uh, they were fundamentally a kind of criticism of commodity culture, of the industrialization of print, um, and particularly the effects of those processes uh, on the bodies and minds of workers. So I think I will end there. Um, I'm gonna turn things over to Nicole, who's gonna sort of, I think, talk about the legacies of Tom Scott. So. about a uh, book artisan after Morris. I'm going to focus today on three bookmakers working within and against Morris's legacy. I'll start with T.J. Cobden Sanderson. I'll look at Albert Hubbard and then Dart Hunter. The first two are roughly contemporaries of Morris and the last one represents a kind of younger generation's extension of the hand press book arts tradition well into the 20th century. So Morris and T.J. Cobden Sanderson, my first uh, focus, uh, Cobden Sanderson was a bookbinder and an erstwhile lawyer. And these two men were friends. Uh, they both promoted the aesthetics and uh, politics of the arts and crafts movement. In 1893, Cobden Sanderson opened his binary, the, the bindery, the Dove's bindery, in a house just opposite Helen Scott Press. Uh, he founded the Dove's Press. He moved from being a binder to a book printer. Uh, and he founded that press in 1900 with Morris's partner, Emery Walker. So there's no one reference to Emery Walker, the businessman. Uh, so this was four years after Morris's death and two years after the Kelmscott Press had closed. So it's sort of um, DJ Cobden Sanderson maybe waiting for his moment respectfully. Um, like Morris, Cobden Sanderson worked to sustain the tradition of printing by hand. And I'm going to tell you. This is uh, a book that uh, the Dove's Press published in 1900. It's called The Ideal Book or Book Beautiful. I thought I'm going to be printing an illustration. Uh, Cobden Sanderson pays tribute to Morris as a calligrapher. So I just gave us this one page here. You can see William Morris in the in the large, um, in the capital letters. Um, he pays tribute to Morris as a calligrapher in particular and underscores the importance of calligraphy generally to the book beautiful, insisting that, quote, handwriting and hand decoration of letter and page are the root of typography, which is something I haven't thought that much about. Uh, but the handwriting is the root of typography, woodcuts, and engravings. And uh, Coffin Sanderson urges every printer to ground themselves in the practice of calligraphy, letting, quote, both hand and soul luxuriate for a while in the art of illumination. So on this page, uh, Morris, uh, T.J. Coffin Sanderson credits Morris for the period's great revival of printing 
and links successful typography to the traditions of the scriptorium, which I think is lovely that this panel has been able to let us see how calligraphy becomes uh, typography. Interestingly, in an earlier version of this, uh, this book uh, that Cobden Sanderson delivered as a lecture in 1892, Coffin Sanderson respectfully makes clear his objections to the master, as he referred to William Morris, uh, as he called Morris, who was in the audience, he called him the master, and Morris was right there. In the lecture, Coffin Sanderson finds that Morris's typography gets in the way of the expression of Morris's ideas. And so if the reader can't get beyond the typography, Cobden Sanderson says, the thing intended to be conveyed will never be conveyed. Uh, Cobden Sanderson objects primarily to three things in Morris's books. Uh, one, he found the inner margins too small, in spite of, I guess, Morris's concerted effort. Uh, two, the type is too heavy. Uh, and three, Morris breaks words and lines of verse for the sake of decorative margins and initial letters. I think that's the worst thing of all, to break up the lines of the verse for the sake of ornamentation. Um, Coppin Sanderson also objects uh, to Morris's medievalism. Eventually, he writes in his journal in 1898, quote, we are the men of the middle and all other ages, but our setting, actual and acquired, is different, and consequently our creations take other forms. To force ourselves into the forms of other times is to be affected and to be useless for our own time. Men of today who affect the forms of other times have their eyes wholly or partially closed. So um, this is an example, of course. This was uh, produced by the Dubs Press. So you can get a sense of, of if you can, yeah, I juxtaposing too would have been nice. So you know, keep, remember Joe's slides and then take a look at this. Um, and then here's another a Bible uh, from Cobden Sanderson that begins with um, Genesis. And if we can think about the initials of the earlier Bibles that we saw and the red lettering, um, and we can see what, what's different here about what Cobden Sanderson is trying to do. The Dove's Bible is thought to be Cobden Sanderson's superlative achievement. We have a leaf of the Bible in the Farfel, in the Farfel collection. It's another, if and when, you know, a must-buy uh, book for the collection. <laughs> in 1908, Cobden Sanderson noted that he chose text for the Dove's Press uh, based on the particular typographical challenge that they presented and also on the work's literary achievement and reflection of creative genius. And he thought the Bible in English was, was exactly that. Um, another pushback, though, another place where Cobden Sanderson continues to wrestle with Morris's influence right up to 1917. I do not believe in the doctrine of William Morris. I do not believe that pleasure in one's work produces <laughs> Nor do I believe that ornament has any special privilege in the production of happiness. Ornament is born of faculty and may or may not be preceded, accompanied, or followed. Um, <laughs> so, and I think this is a response to the essay that Joe pointed us to, the lesser arts. I think this is where, you know, um, so so there we have uh, T.J. Calvin Sanderson, a uh, sort of immediate contemporary of Morris, is very much working in the shadow of Morris, but cleared his own space to do something very different um, aesthetically. Um, this, so we're shifting, we're crossing the Atlantic. Um, Hand and Brain, 1898. This is both the essay on socialism, including one by Morris and other names we have been, uh, recognized uh, from George Bernard Shaw to um, Edward Carpenter. And this is produced by the Roycrofters at the Roycroft Shop in the East of Mara, New York. Um, as you can see, it is printed on handmade Helmscott paper in a limited uh, edition. The Roycroft Press. Uh, was established five years earlier in 1893, a year after its founder, Albert Hubbard, a Morris acolyte, had met the master, um, as well as T.J. Cogden Sanderson at Kelmscott. Um, Hubbard's hand press, can't, excuse me, I lost my spot in my nose. Uh, Hubbard's hand press sustained a transatlantic arts and crafts tradition. So he takes the Morris hand press tradition and revives it sustains it in upstate New York. Hubbard went on to establish the Roycroft community, a group of artisans, uh, printers, furniture makers, metalsmiths, leather workers, bookbinders, 
organized around the arts and crafts aesthetic and principles, political principles. By 1910, they numbered around 500 in the community, and it became a site for meetings uh, for radicals and political reformers of all stripes. And the buildings are still there. The Wyckoff community can be visited, and the inn is, you know, bed and breakfast type of place and everything. Um, Hubbard would later distance himself from uh, socialism, aiming to adhere to socialist ideals while also sort of embracing what he felt was a very kind of American free enterprise, entrepreneurship, uh, innovative spirit. Uh, but this book signals his uh, allegiance towards his uh, socialism at his um, earlier phase. Another book that signals his allegiance to Morris, and this is part of the collection upstairs, is Little Journeys to the Homes of English Authors. Uh, this was a 14 volume series published between 1895 and 1910. And again, if you can picture even the Morris's um, Chaucer, the Kelm Scott Chaucer, I think this border very, uh, is, is clearly meant to remind readers of Morris's uh, craft. Um, this copy of Little Shirt, I already said that, it's upstairs. Uh, in this book, Hubbard describes a pilgrimage to Kelm Scott Press, where he meets Morris, and then across the way, he meets T.J. Cobden Sanderson at the bindery, and he witnesses an argument between the two, and just humor me, I thought this was hilarious. So Hubbard reports that Morris, quote, silenced his opponent by smothering his batteries, all of which will be better understood when I explain that the old man was large in stature, bluff, bold, and strong voiced, whereas Cobden Sanderson was small, redheaded, meek, and wears bicycle trousers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you can see on uh, this page, Hubbard spoke with Morris about American literature, apparently, uh, and there's Emory Walker again, um, the businessman who connects um, uh, Morris to P.J. Coffin Sanderson, uh, who was expecting that William Morris had no sympathy for American art and small respect for art literature. But apparently, William Morris uh, read Huckleberry Finn and Uncle Remus and uh, Walt Whitman and Emerson. So, as well as, uh, Hubbard's own book. <laughs> um, let's see, this is an example of Roy Croft, um, an, 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 a Roy Croft title page. Um, I just learned this to prepare this presentation. Albert and Alice Hubbard co-authored this book, and it makes sense because Justinian and Theodora were a powerhouse political couple of early common era Byzantium. I had no idea, but it made a lot of sense to me that they would co-author this book because Alice Hubbard was um, a leader in the Warcraft community, an important uh, leader in the community. She was an ardent feminist. She marched in the first Washington, D.C. suffragist parade. Um, and it's worth noting Annie Cobby, Annie Cobby San, Cobb and Sanderson, TJ's wife, was also a prominent suffragette. Um, so, but I wanted to point out, uh, you know, this sort of a simplified, uh, uh, sort of um, streamlined arts and crafts style. Um, the decorative border uh, and the initial on this next page, I uh, think, is. Uh, very beautiful mm -hmm. here, the decorative border of the initial. But I wanted to point out, it didn't come out right in my picture, but this little DH in the corner is going to lead us to our next uh, figure on this journey uh, of William Morris' influence. Um, uh, and you see the same thing, another title page from the uh, Roy Croft publication, uh, very reminiscent of William Morris's art. And then again, another little DH in the corner, right? Who might that be? That is Dari Hunter, um, who is a figure of local importance. Uh, his Mountain House Press was established in Chilla Coffee in 1922, and it's still in operation, producing prints on Hunter's original hand presses. Uh, before I go on, then I'll refer you to the Dart Hunter website. I think it's darthunter.com for more information about Hunter, the Mountain House Press and the Dart Hunter Studios, which is an outfit that is producing today a whole range of products based on Dart Hunter's art and on arts and crafts aesthetic um, more generally. Dart Hunter was born in Steubenville, Ohio in 1883. His father was a newspaper publisher, eventually moved the family to Chilla Coffee, and this is where Hunter had his earliest training in typesetting and typography uh, as a newspaper. 
kid. Um, in 1904, Hunter applied for a job with the Roy Cockers, and I guess was turned down, but he was super enthusiastic and went up there anyway. Um, <laughs> This is all history, right? So apparently, uh, within a few months, he was designing stained glass windows and uh, title pages, as I've already shown you, for Hubbard's press. Uh, he also tied his hand at pottery, furniture, and jewelry. He left the Roy Crofters in 1910, objecting to Hubbard's increasing um, sort of commercialization and the sense that he is leaving behind the socialist mission. So in the book arts, Hubbard, uh, Hunter, excuse me, Hunter's interest was drawn to handmade paper, um, and he became a sort of super paper specialist. He made paper according to 17th century methods in a mill that he built in New York. He also developed his own type font, cutting the punches entirely by hand and casting the font then by hand. So he positioned himself to make books you know, entirely on his own, a one-man uh, bookmaker. He describes these processes in great detail in his books, classes and colophons, uh, such as the one that I'll show you. You can see he to it a little bit um, here. But the other one I wanted to show you, because this title page uh, indicates, right, to a copy of Ohio and the Mountain House Press. And I know this slide didn't come out really well, but the, the text over here, this is a very long note regarding um, the making of this book, where he carefully details the time-intensive labor and expense of producing a type font entirely by hand. He indicates the 17th century printer's manual that guided him in this effort. He's only used this type that he took so long to create on five books issued by his own press, and he promises that this type font will be entirely destroyed when he decides to start publishing his book. Um, so and I want to give a, a you know recognize that, that primitive of course is a, is a colonizing term is one that we would not use today. Um, Hunter is very interesting you know, in I think in the history of the study of the book and book arts. He deserves credit for thinking about book production in a global context and, and recognizing the value of non-European traditions in uh, at a time when bibliography and the study of the book arts generally were really focused on. Europe and the European traditions. He traveled all over the world and collected samples. So let's see, and I should have mentioned all along, these books are part of our collection. We have a whole bunch of dark hundred books upstairs, and we have um, all the Roycrofter stuff. They're very strong, and it's time. Miriam is telling me, so I'm done. <laughs>
Any other questions? <laughs> I'll have a question. Yeah. I, I, I want to thank all of you for you for putting this together, and uh, it, it was such a fascinating from each of your perspectives. Uh, really, really great and interesting. Uh, I'm wondering uh, more from a uh, financial standpoint. That I mean, it, Morris was obviously well off, but um, I was kind of surprised that uh, I, I believe the the Chaucer sold for. 20 pounds? No. No, at, at the time it was. Pretty, at the time? Yes. Which, which really, I mean, for the number of years, a lot. Of, I mean, he could have made any money, could he, at, at that price, do you think? Or, uh, I, I don't know about the Chaucer specifically, but I, I've heard that he did actually make a, a slight profit <laughs> mm -hmm. um, through the Count Scott Press, although I don't know that that was necessarily his intention. I mean, yeah. one thing that I did not build into my presentation, but which is the, the obvious and perennial criticism of what he was doing, is, is the expense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and thinking about that in relationship to his socialist politics, right? Because yeah. all of these sort of cheap commercially produced books um, that he's that he's railing against are also part of the story of the the rise of literacy and getting books and information out to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you know he's a, uh, a, a a socialist book producer, <laughs> um, but he's producing books that can only be sold to a to a fairly limited. Market, mm -hmm. um, so that's that's certainly the paradox here. Um, but I think it was something he was willing to do um, because he was sort of just so fed up with what he saw as the um, on the consumption side, the coarsening <laughs> of modern life and its effect on taste. Mm -hmm. um, but then what that meant on the the production end um, for the people who were who were making and producing these things. Mm -hmm. Um, and perhaps that's one commonality that, that Dart Hunter and he had. I, I think neither really cared much about, you know, what uh, the monetary remuneration was going to be for years and years of work, but really driven by, you know, creating something truly beautiful and harmonious, uh, which beautiful and harmonious, but also but also useful. And useful. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's again, it's that that integration and that that essay I refer to the, the 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 lesser arts. You know, both of those things were important to him, um, and he was just very upset, as with Ruskin, how in the nineteenth century those things seemed to be going their different ways. <laughs> that there were things that were useful and and cheap, and there were things that were were beautiful. Mm -hmm. So. That actually feeds into a question I have, um, if you don't mind. Um, rare and high point valuable items like the Bible, like Helmscott Press, um, Mountain House Press books, Deluxe, I think Miriam used the word, um, can be intimidating for a lot of students and other visitors. Um, so something I'm always thinking about um, is how can we, including myself as a we, um, sort of lessen the intimidation factor um, when it comes to researching and accessing these items and provide more equitable access. Um, again, coming back to that sort of tension between um, wanting wanting them to be useful and accessible to everyone, but in fact they are not. So I'd be curious for your thoughts on that. With, with the Bible, it's kind of easy because you can point out that this thing has lasted 800 years mm -hmm. and it was made to be used. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, it's not a, um, it was never meant to be something that was admired from afar or not touched. And even those most fabulous, you know, really, really the less, like the moralized Bibles, were, were used, right? They were touched, they were kissed, they were read, you know. Um, one of the one of the, another book that I work on is a completely different kind of book, but it's um, the pontifical. It's a, a book of rules for bishops, like how to do an exorcism and how to do this and that and the other thing. And the big debate about that book is signs of use. Does it demonstrate that people used it? Um, and there's particular questions about that. But it's an interesting thing to think about that these books have been held in the hands of hundreds of people, maybe maybe thousands, and, and over 
over hundreds of years, right? And so that's the first thing is to sort of mystify the fragility of the item. Um, but the other part of the access, I wish Neil were here because yeah. it's so much of that, that book is about the words in the book. And um, it is so um, sadly foreign to people. You know, they, don't, they can't make that connection. On the other hand, again, the cool thing about the Bible is that it is why would it have <laughs> So people can kind of look at it, but, but um, that's the first place that I go is that kind of sturdiness of that item. Yeah. Um, I could I could respond to that as well. I mean, what's interesting about this Bible is its size, and that these books were mass produced at, at these cathedral schools um, for students, for university students, um, clerics, so, and and then exported around Europe. But they're they're called pocket Bibles because you could put them in your cloak. You know, they were really more kind of personal books, um, unlike uh, other Bibles, which are much more large scale. But I did want to say just one thing about teaching with the um, teaching this Bible in class, which has evolved for me since I first started here. I would bring the students up to special collections. We would look at it. But it's a difficult thing to do when you have, let's say, 20 students in the class in such a small book, and you're trying to talk about something um, and the other students can't see what you're talking about, which really makes it a challenge. And so one of the great things uh, that's happened in uh, the study of books in the past five years, I would say, is the digitization process um, and making these accessible. So now what happens is when I go in to teach this um, manuscript, um, the students have it right there on their laptops. The, the, the original is there, they can look at it up close and see it, but they can also follow what's going on along on their laptops, and it's just so much easier um, to teach. And then the other th great thing about it is it, it makes it accessible to everyone around the world. So that's completely transformed my, um, my scholarship, is the availability of books like this now. I mean, just quantities of medieval books I can look at in my in my office, um, rather than traditionally, you know, having to write a grant to get to a particular library, going over. I mean, it was a really um, time-consuming thing. So it's, it's been fantastic. Those are both really helpful. I think John has a question. Uh, we actually have a comment online okay. and a, and a question for Dr. Reynolds. So get ready to help. Okay, <laughs> the comment first is uh, the Don E. Adeletta, I apologize if I'm not asking. Yeah. Thank you. Type shop in 222 Siegfried Hall here on campus contains a room full of printing presses and types uh, from the era that Dart Hunter would have used. Graphic designer Darren Baker on the Chill Coffee campus is in communication with that press. Mm -hmm. And then the question for Dr. Reynolds uh, Did Roycroft have any connections with famous radical author agitators from the early 20th, early 20th century, such as Upton Sinclair, Jack London, or Charlotte Perkins Gilman? I don't know. <laughs> so I didn't in the audience. I go, I don't know, but that would that would make perfect sense from what I understand. The Roy Clark community was, you know, became a, a, a gathering place for uh, all all posts and all sorts of, of intellectuals and radicals and reformers. So that would seem entirely likely. I don't have any just my knowledge of the catalog, I don't think the uh, you know, published or worked with any of them in the Roycroft Press, um, but that wouldn't surprise me at all. His dates are, he went, he and Alice went down on the Lusitania in, in 1915, so if that helps us think about who they might have had contact with, you know, in terms of write, writers and, and so forth. Um, but that's a great question. I don't know. Sorry. <clears throat> I want to speak to the previous question just, okay. just really briefly. I mean, I think the digitization that, that you were talking about is very important, um, especially as a kind of supplement. I mean, it's not a substitute for students getting the actual books in their hands, which just totally sparks their their curiosity and their, their passion for study and, and research. But it is good given the fragility of things that, that if they want to spend more time with it, that they have the the, the digital access. Um, another thing is, I think that the, in my experience, the books that are most intimidating to students are the older books, 
uh, which actually tend to be much better made and meant to last, and you can sort of demystify things for them. The real problem with students is when you put the late 19th and early 20th century crappy books in their hands, uh, you know, made on paper with high acid content that, you know, flakes when you look at it, um, which are things that tend not to intimidate them, and so you need to, to tell them to, to back off a little bit. Um, but I think the other answer to that question is, um, you know, we, we are a public university, and they are citizens of Ohio who are paying tuition to come to this university. They are the of these these books and and they should feel like this stuff is like some kind of precious thing that they're going to sort of violate uh, they, they need to have some ownership over them and, and that just begins with letting them be with the objects it is a really special thing to be able to bring them upstairs and, and i've been with different in different kinds of collections in different different moments of things up there everything you can see is informative and inspiring and I think um, it really is a matter of taking the time to do it at the end of the day. I think the digitization thing is also really important in as much as it helps contextualize these things so that you know they, they can look at a bunch of things online or we can and then they can come up to see one and hold it and look at it and, and they're just even you can when I go to archives, I like to use the digital life, digitized documents because I can actually read them better. I can blow them up and understand them. But I can't appreciate the size of the document. I can't, you know, without seeing it. So I think the two things together really work well to make them accessible. Yeah, if I could make a follow-up comment about, about this. So the way that the, the transmission of writing began with the scroll in, the, in ancient Egypt, the Romans invented the book, and, you know, the book continued um, to exist until really the, the rise of the internet, which is, so what's happened with the internet is that now we're, we've returned to scroll line rather than, and, and one of the things that I talk about to, in terms of demonstrating the appreciation of these books is that how much more user friendly they are in terms of navigating them you know, moving from different parts of a particular book to another part is, is much more easy than the, the scrolling process, which can really drive you nuts. And so I, I talk with them about that, you know, the, you, traditionally when you read a scroll, you would unfurl it and furl it and unfurl it and furl it, but you couldn't really, you know, kind of go to a particular part of, of a text the way you can with a book. And so in some ways, you know, we're, we're at this cusp now of the transmission of knowledge where, um, where, where a particular vessel like a book is, I think, ultimately much more user friendly and um, maybe technological advancement isn't necessarily, I mean, this kind of panacea for folks. And, and interestingly, the students have been responding to this because they're used to the idea of scrolling, and I think that that, that it kind of drives them, it can drive you crazy, especially if you're spending all your time in front of a computer screen. All really great. Thank you all. Any other questions? There's no other follow-up in I have a bad comment for Charles. I totally think that's the Virgin Mary now. I've been sitting there all day. <laughs> Problematic. First of all, it is a faster, but it makes sense that it's sort of a prefiguring of that you know super sectionist Christian position. But also, Mary's not depicted very much in these Bibles. I mean, Mary doesn't play a big role in the Bible, really. And and um, the, the cult of the Virgin Mary is super important for the 12th century, 13th century, when she this would have been a thing. Um, so it's still unique and unusual, but what's also interesting to me is that I did some research on Esther in the Bible, and I didn't come up with, nobody came up with this, and nobody's not, the wrong people are talking to each other, I think, about, about that image, and the image of Esther. Um, so it's, it's super interesting, I'm going to say nothing about it. And I could talk about Justin and Theodore all day. <laughs> I don't know if that would be associated with just with Theodore, because she was, she had a bad rap. Did she really? Yeah, she was scandalous. <laughs> Charles, I wanted to respond too to something you said about the scrolling and, and actually think about how in the work that I've done with students, um, there's this interesting kind of dialectic, right? So precisely because of the reading that students are doing now in 
in digital environments. Um, there's a lot more attention, at least in literary studies these days, to, to illustration, which was something that had been written off for a long time. Because students are becoming much more used to being in environments where they're looking at text and image together. Um, so that to return to books, they pay attention to the pictures. They pay attention to the look of the page. <laughs> Um, or because, you know, uh, platforms like Microsoft Word that they're used to working in, that they can manipulate fonts all the time. Um, there is, I think, a kind of interest in typography, and they notice those kinds of things that, that students might not have 20 or 25 years ago. Um, so the kinds of reading practices that, that students are involved now in digital environments, I think, are really making them canny observers. <laughs> of things in old books that students, you know, a generation ago might not have thought about. Um, if, if I could respond to Miriam here, um, I think what's interesting about the image of Esther in this book is that that is the only uh, so-called historiated initial of yeah. an individual from the Bible. Yeah. There, there are these monsters and some of them are um, women, yeah. um, but you know, it, it's interesting that trying to think of for whom the, a book like that was produced and why they would actually have that one representation of Esther and then maybe this this siren, um, which is kind of the, the opposite um, type of uh, conception of womanhood um, in the, that particular manuscript. So I wonder, you know, if the original reader could have been a woman or that maybe even the foundation of where it was produced could could have been for female readership. It could have, yeah, yeah. I actually saw a manuscript on online it's at, at the um, British Museum, I think, British Library, British Library, recently, and it's from, it's it's placed in northern France, and it's contemporary, and it's got that same beautiful blue and yellow, the blue and red little yeah. stuff in it. Hey, I know that that's like a dime a dozen, but it just seems like if you could line up enough of these manuscripts, I've often thought if you could line up our book with some really more stuff, enough wallpaper, you would come up with one of these images, you know, um, where they could be, they could be, you could find correspondence. Um, I've heard at least three future dissertation projects. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just want to thank all of you again for really just fascinating, thought-provoking presentations and discussion. I learned from all of you all the time, um, and I'm grateful for that, and I learned new things here today from questions also. Um, thanks to all of you for coming.